they do quite a few of those things. Um, so with regards to you know, who should file a tax return, again, that's one of the things you are required to know. IRS does pub they do publicize this every year. This is for 2014 filing requirements. So if you have to this file, and they're independent or single, and they have income of 10150 or more, then they are required to file a return. Okay? So what does that mean to you? When you're verifying that file, that's if they did not file a return, that's complete information. So what does that mean? That means that you have to stop the presses, uh, verification will not be complete until they can either, until they, they appeal, not appeal, to the, amend their return. Now you can't make them amend their return. You can't apply that amendment. You have can strongly recommend, you can strongly encourage them, because uh, that's between them, them and the IRS, right? So even though you can't make them amend their returns, if they're required to file, you can stop the process and sign a play. And that's, what, and that's what you have to do, because you cannot complete the application if you have conflict information in the file. Like I said, conflict information supersedes verification. So even though you're not required to be a tax expert, you need to be able to see if you have something else, if it's especially with an independent student. You have to file there and they made you know fifteen thousand dollars and they didn't file a return, that's a red flag for you. Okay? And that could be someone who's not who's not even picked verification. Remember I said earlier, conflict information supersedes verification. So if you have a file, maybe you didn't, you know, initially you know look at it because they weren't picked verification, but then you look at it for some other reason. Maybe you won a scholarship or something like that. And whenever you see conflict information, it has to be resolved. Okay? It's one thing you don't know about it, but when it comes right in your face there, then you have to, to resolve it. That's the other thing as far as the tax returns. When we say you have to get a tax transcript, don't you know uh, request tax returns for anybody who don't want it. Because let's say they bring it to you, once you have it, you got even supposed to review. You're supposed to do file 13. You know, guess if, you know, trash can file 13. Technically, based on the regs, once it's received, this institution is supposed to be reviewed. Yeah, um, it's just the FYI. That, that one's for free. Okay, I won't charge you that. That little, that little nugget. But again, this is what you're supposed to look at as far as um, uh, the tax amount, the amount of earnings they they, they receive when they should file a return. So if they you see merit filing jointly, those are income thresholds there. So if you get somebody's merit filing jointly and their income is more than that amount, they're supposed to file a return. Again, you cannot make them out of return, but you do have to stop the process. As long as you guys get that part, you cannot process financial aid if there's complete information in the file. Okay? You can um, ask them to, you know, and the thing is, they have two choices. Either to amend the return or get a statement from the IRS saying they were not required to file, which they will not really get. Unless it's something that, you know, not published in the, in the uh, IRS guide here. So if they can get you a statement, you know, it has to be legit, right? You know, no, not, you know, Somebody's making up stuff, but something from the IRS, better head and everything, you know, this person was not required to file X, Y, Z, Y. Uh, but other than that, they would need to amend the returns. Can't make them amend returns. <laughs> and it's unfortunate, too, when you look at, uh, let me see where we're going here. Uh, and we go here, let's go to this one, too, tax filing status. So these are things that you have to know about, too. And if you see someone, and I'll say this high level, for the most part, nine out of ten times, if a student does head of household, they should not be married. And there's, you know, there's a clause there, considered unmarried. And so they always, I don't want to go too far in that. But that if they're married, they should not be filed head of household. If, if the, the only time you will see somebody legitimately being able to file head of household if they're married is um, if, because keep in mind, you're doing this for 2014, you're doing it in January 2015, right? So it's possible, let's say get married in January or whatever. But then at the last six months of the year in 2015, they weren't married or they, they were, I don't even really want to go into everything, but they, because it's just so much, it's so high level for you guys, you know, like, but, but let's say not, they should be doing the head of house if they're married. There is a small exception there, you know, for a small group of people that you probably would never, and you may have one or two people that fall in that where they could be married today and could have filed head of household in 2014. Again, it's a very, very small group. It's in the concept page 17. That's the IRS publication that's in there. Um, and then basically, you know, they were not married, you know, the last six months of the year and all this stuff, whatever. But uh, again, you, you could have very few students that fall in that category. Uh, but yeah, I guess you can say very few. It depends on, you know, the population of students that you have too. Um, to keep it clean, if you see married and head of household, 
it's completely different. You want to resolve it. You want to make sure. And you may find that they fall in that little small pool of students. <coughs> and it's okay. You know, if you verify that you you signed it off, signed off on it, and <coughs> let's leave it at that. But these are things you want to look at um, as far as making sure that filing status is correct. But if you do find one, and this is one you can find the most, I think, is for a household that they were married, they did not fit that little small, you know, criteria, and they really they're supposed to amend their return. So again, you can't make them go amend their return. And unfortunately, we have a lot of tax preparers that will allow those married families to do that household. That's a HR blog, Jackson Hughes, whoever they were. They, and unfortunately, I've heard students and families say they sit right there together. You know, the mom and dad both here, and they, the tax preparer does head of household for them, and they see that they're they know that they're married. Again, that's between them and their tax preparer. As good stewards of these funds, you still have to say, that's important. I believe what you're saying. I've seen it done. However, as they, I cannot trust your financial aid because um, I have to be aware of this. And based on what we have here, you should have filed American family journal and American family separately. You know? So and, and this way it's important to deepen a student and when the parents do that, and for whatever reason, they're doing it for a bigger refund check or whatever. It's unfortunate that a student's aid has to be delayed because mom and dad were trying to do whatever, you know, and it's really unfortunate. Uh, and you guys can be the very bad news, you know, so I can't trust this defendant's delayed because this, you know. Uh, have you guys had that happen? I guess we get real familiar with that. And it's really unfortunate. So what, what do you do? You just, you know, document the file and hope that the parent makes the return. And you know, if you guys have seen you have that happen, do you have any institutional funds for the students or? Basically, this definitely give them. It just kind of, yeah. So it's unfortunate, but it ha has it happened. Those who've not seen it yet, you will see it. You know, if you stay in this profession, uh, where uh, you have to say, I can't process your aid because of your parents' filing status, or you know, or your filing status, you know, student's filing status. Uh, so it's an opening for um, I have no for some students. And again, it's more detailed information in Pub 17 for that. Okay. So verification is made after the first disbursement. It is possible that, you know, get transaction one, it's clean, not selected, then they make a change, you know, <laughs> uh, or you make a change, and then you get a, um, a new item that's pushed in, and you're required to verify that to make sure that there are not any adjustments that need to be made. Again, like I said, years ago, um, schools would sort of lock a file that they verified, uh, or and such, or just what they paid on, but you're required to review such an and especially that. Some schools, I, from what I hear, are still locking files, but again, the department is saying that you're required to look at those centralized search just to make sure there's nothing you change or adjust to the file. Okay, I'm just still looking at adjustments uh, that are made afterwards. Um, so basically, if there's slight verification after the fact, you just want to um, make sure the EFC uh, is still in the same range for the Pell disbursement. Uh, there's sometimes you have to recalculate. Uh, that students Pell uh, based on the new EFC that's there, uh, and that's typically done in this process as well. Uh, and so basically, if you have to be calculated, you're gonna pay um, on that new ISA, all right? Uh, let's say you do the recalculation, uh, the Pell rate is still the same. If you actually keep the Pell as far as your loan disbursement, you have to make sure that you actually wait and get a clean ISA before you can actually do the loan. That's, that's in detail there too. Uh, it just depends on the recalculation, where you're actually recalculating it or making corrections there, okay? This is going back to interim disbursements here. Um, that's based on if you're choosing to make interim disbursements, which, you know, don't necessarily recommend those, okay? Here, um, what you see here in this next slide here is if a subsidized uh, student financial assistance program is at Swilly Pell, if there was a change made, um, based on the verification there, uh, then you need to make sure that you're getting the corrected EFC, uh, and that's gonna be on the, your new, and you have a valid ICER that has that correct EFC uh, before you actually make those disbursements there. Verification status code. Now with this one, all power recipients must be assigned a verification status code, and B is gonna be for verified, and that's whether they were selected by the student or the school, okay? And you're always processing your PAL in your office to support as far as you know, making these adjustments there. If W there, 
They were selected by the Department of Education. Uh, you choose to make the first payment, um, upheld that documentation. They said you're going to introduce first when you're going to put the there. Then you adjusted the currently after the verified school complete. As their CPS like students, um, they're, they're not verified. And this is, um, do you know if Michelle, any of you guys do quality, uh, follow the quality assurance? This is a select group of student, or no, some schools where they're going to put an S there because they have exclusions to some of the verification rules. They call QA schools, quality assurance schools. They have to verify students, but the institution decides what they're going to verify. Uh, so schools have to make applications to be a part of the uh, QA uh, school um, cohort. Um, but they do verify, but the school determines you know, what they're going to verify for those students. So um, that as it will be those schools who were, uh, they didn't verify to the student because it wasn't part of their, you know, QA or their determination of how they don't verify that particular student, okay? And the last one is blank there, um, verification of the form because uh, they were not selected by the student or CPS, okay? Let's say the responsibility of this to verify the student's file, um, admins must be reviewed, for if there's any database matches or rejects or C codes there. So in this to verify, any kind of C codes you have, um, that student must be uh, reviewed as well, as you see there. Subsequent ISO changes, uh, as I mentioned several times this morning, must be reviewed because it could change aid eligibility. Uh, if you have assumptions by the processor, you'll see those in ISO too. These are some list of things that you guys require to do in addition to uh, the um, verified items we talked about earlier. And this is basically looking at conflict information so it doesn't add up there. Or there was a uh, database mismatch, either where it's like service or VA or all those database matches that they have, um, data birth and those kind of things. So if they get a C code, for the most, not for the most part, you got to resolve the C code for your first aid. So when are your copies of WTs required? So you're not required to get a W2 for everybody, unless it's your institution policy. Uh, this slide does tell you, as far as the verification process, when you're required to get those uh, W2s. Um, for the most part, if they, for instance, if they get that O2 code, you know, if they do, do the data retrieval, and then you get the um, clean uh, transaction, the, the data retrieval, you would need to get the W2, unless your institution policy says so. Now, you would need to get a W2 if, let's say, they were on the tax when they were married, and at the time of application, and now they're both separated, and you're only using one income on the application on the FAFSA, if you want to get the W-2, so you can separate the income earned from work there. Um, so you would, in those cases, you would be required to get the W-2, so you can say, okay, what was the, let's say the mom and dad are separated, and the mom is applying for aid for the child, you would already show what portion of the AGI was the mom, or income earned from work. So in those cases, you'd be required to get the W-2 there. Um, and also, when you look at extensions, uh, if they file an, an extension with regards to their tax return there, um, you can also use W-2s in those regards as well, um, with regards to when they, have, when they file an extension. The department is not going to be providing the verification worksheets that I, I kind of alluded to earlier. Uh, they used years ago, for years, they would give you verification worksheets. And even when they provided the worksheet, schools would not require you to use it. They would create your own if they chose to do that. Um, but this year, they're not even going to provide it. You have to actually sort of create your own or create those things, which doesn't want to do that. But they're going to give you the language you're going to use to use the verification worksheet. And you can tweak it, like I said, any way you choose to, with the exception of that state education purpose. That's fixed, and you cannot change that, okay? I'm into questions about, yes, ready to go verify the file, right? <laughs> or not, or not. Uh, again, this was definitely high level, but we wanted to give, give you, you know, a feel for verification. Um, I do recommend that.